and welcome back to another episode of Beyond the To-Do List. I'm your host, Eric Fisher, and this is the show where I talk to the people behind the productivity. This week, I'm excited to share with you a conversation I had with Ron Friedman. Ron is an award-winning social psychologist. He specializes in human motivation and has a brand new book out called Decoding Greatness, How the Best in the World reverse engineer success. And in this book, he makes the case that success doesn't come from talent or from the 10,000 hours of practice rule made popular by Malcolm Gladwell. Instead, success comes from mastering a certain simple skill, reverse engineering. We're going to dive into why reverse engineering works better than just having raw talent or that 10,000 hours of practice and how to start reverse engineering. I know you're going to love this one, so I'm going to get out of the way and just say, enjoy this conversation with Ron Friedman. Well, this week, it is my privilege to welcome to the show Ron Friedman. Ron, welcome to Beyond the To-Do List. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me, Eric. I mean, we we were connected a while ago. Gosh, it's been years now, right? When the the summit Mm. happened. But Yeah. uh, yeah, since then, You've come out with a brand new book called Decoding Greatness, How the Best in the World Reverse Engineer Success. And I love this because I love one. I love the words reverse engineer. I love analyzing things. I love looking at things and saying, how did they do that? What did they do to get to that place? Uh, It's why biographies are a certain kind of fascination to me, documentaries as well. But I'm curious for you as a, a psychologist you study top performance. How did you come into this realm of reverse engineering and this this perspective as to why reverse engineering is so important in terms of performance? Well, as you noted, I'm a social psychologist and one who specializes in top performance. And my first book, The Best Place to Work, was about taking all of the science, over a thousand academic studies, and translating them into plain English so that regardless of whether you're someone who's just starting out or you lead a large organization, you have access to the latest science on how you can create a great workplace and elevate your performance. But there was something missing in that book. And what was missing is that even within the best workplaces, there is a range of performance level. You have some people who are operating at a high level, other people are not. And so I was curious about what is it that differentiates top performers from everyone else? And so I did a lot of research in decoding greatness, looking at what is it that differentiates those at the top from average employees. And what I found is that in many cases, they're utilizing a practice that many of us know about, but none of us have ever read a book about. And so uh, that practice is reverse engineering, which simply means finding extraordinary examples in your field, whatever field that is, and then working backward to figure out how those examples were created. And what I, I love about this framing is that it really stands in stark contrast to the typical stories we hear about success. And there are two stories, and Eric, I'm sure you're very familiar with it, and I'm sure your listeners are too. The first story is that success or greatness comes from talent. And so from this perspective, we're all born with certain inner strengths. And the key to finding your greatness is finding a field that allows your strengths to shine. Then there's the story of practice. This is the Malcolm Gladwell story, the 10,000 hours, practice, 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 get the right practice regimen, do lots of hard work, and eventually you'll be great and then you'll succeed. But there's a third story. And that third story is one that so many entrepreneurs and inventors and top performers in a wide array of fields have been utilizing for generations. And that's reverse engineering. And so I just felt like it's time that there was a book about this. I think there's just such a stigma that we can get into that people have in the back of their heads about reverse engineering because they think, oh, that's just stealing and that's just copying. But you know what? This is how people learn. This is how we learn. We learn by taking apart great examples. And what you need is a system for doing that. And that's what this book offers. Yeah, it's uh, kind of goes along with that phrase. uh, I'm going to butcher it, but basically standing on the shoulders of giants. Mm-hmm, exactly right. People have done things that have come before. It can't help but be influential, whether or not it's a direct influence on you particularly or influential in terms of even just the niche that it came from or culture at large. The contributions people have made before us are, you know, unerasable. They're, they're bedrock. In other words, they, they exist. They're foundational. And then we build on top of them. 
Exactly right. And, and I'm going to give you a study that really, I think, shatters some of the stigma around studying other people closely. But before I do that, I just want to mention for the folks listening, I mean, this is a productivity show. And so if you're looking to be productive, you're going to have a tough time doing that if you're trying to work from a blank canvas, not studying what the masters in the field have produced. What I'm trying to do here is give you a, a roadmap for deconstructing works you admire to understand how you can recreate them. And so let me go back to that study for a second. So I think that, as I mentioned, a lot of people assume that if you study someone else's work too closely, you're going to be a hack. And this is why I think it's so important to look at the science on this. So there's research looking at what happens when people copy. And this is a study that was conducted out of the University of Tokyo, where they had amateur artists come into the lab and they divided them into two groups. One group was asked to create original drawings for three days straight. The second group was asked to create original drawings on the first day. On the second day, they were asked to copy the work of an established artist. And on the third day, they were asked to resume original drawings once more. And what they were interested in is comparing the drawings on the third day between the two groups. And they actually brought in objective raters to rate the works of the two groups to identify which of the two groups was more creative. And what they found was that not only did the group that copied, uh, not only were they more creative on the final day of the experiment, but they were creative in ways that had nothing to do with the work they copied. And it's because the practice of looking at a particular artwork and then trying to recreate it, that forces you to compare your instinctive inclinations against the choices of an established artist. And that process of consistently comparing what you want to do versus what the other person actually did, that opens your eyes to new opportunities that are hidden within your own work. So far from making you a copycat or a hack, taking the time to study someone else's work more closely actually makes you better. Interesting. So if I wanted to say be a screenwriter, I can justify watching all the Netflix, right? You know what? You say that comically, <laughs> but let me tell you something. I, 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 one of the things I love about this message is that this gives you license to really dive in to those guilty pleasures because it's not just about if you want to become a screenwriter. I'm going to say if you want to be a better podcaster, you should watch more Netflix. And the reason for that is it's in combining the unique elements from different fields that makes you original. And so it's not just about finding, you know, let's say you want to, you want to become the, the number one podcaster. You want to study, you know, know free economics, right? Like, what are they doing? How do I recreate that? So that gives you one formula. But the reality is if all you're doing is recreating free economics, you're not going to be a successful free economics. And it's for two reasons. One is because free economics has particular strengths that are uh, inherent to the producers. So Dubner's a great writer. He's a really good uh, narrator. And it's going to be tough for you to reproduce that in exactly the same way or even better because he's got inherent strengths. But beyond that, audience expectations shift with time. So what Dubner was doing 10 years ago today is like common practice, right? He was original at the time, but today that's not really what audiences, it's not going to be as novel. People are going to be expecting it. And so the key to being creative is actually looking at different fields. So it might be like looking at, I don't know, Dave on Hulu. I don't know what shows you watch, but there are so many interesting shows out there that are very different and combining that with the typical formula, that's how you find a new formula to push the envelope and become novel while reverse engineering. Yeah, it, it's interesting to me because I, I feel like this is this third path that is very different from the other two that you mentioned, the one where you're born with it. You just have the talent. Mm -hmm. It's almost like being born with superpowers. In other words, you you, yeah. you have them. Actually, let's use an analogy here. I think this will really work and I kind of want to geek out on this. So the first instance is you are born naturally with the talent. And I'm going to go with saying that's Superman. OK, he's, he's yeah. born with those powers. Now, of course, him landing on Earth is what caused him to have those powers, et cetera. Not going to go too geeky there. The other side of it, though, the 10,000 hours rule of intentional practice, the Malcolm Gladwell thing, that's Batman. He doesn't have any powers. Of course, his wealth is a power, so to speak. But uh, you get what I'm saying is that he puts in the time to focus yeah. on becoming. And you're saying there's this third way. So I'm trying to figure out who that is in terms of the world. Of Sherlock Holmes. Yeah, Sherlock you know, Holmes. you're right. Yeah. 
it's working backwards and it's like the, the art of deduction. It was interesting. Uh, you raised the Batman versus Superman in graduate school. Uh, one of the experiments I was very close to running is looking at what happens when people listen to the Superman theme song versus the Rocky theme song, because Rocky also falls into yes. that man made uh, group. And it's kind of like um, entity versus incremental theory, which is the Carol Dweck research on can you get a little bit better versus growth versus fixed mindsets, right? So the, the thinking was, do these songs put us in those moods where we feel like we can do anything, whereas Superman should be a little bit demotivating because you weren't born Superman. So therefore, that should not elevate your performance. That was a study we were considering, doing, which is maybe like a little bit of, a, of an ad for if you're interested in geeking out on nonsensical things, maybe graduate school's for you. <laughs> <laughs> so that's where we spend all that time. That's another way to justify there. That's exactly so. right. But, but I'll tell you, I'll, I'll tell you a story that I think really crystallizes all this. And that is the story of Barack Obama. And not a lot of people know this story where when Barack Obama first entered politics, he was not a success off the bat. In fact, he got trounced his first race for Congress. And the problem, if you can believe it, was that he was a terrible speaker. He had been a law school professor for years years. And he was used to lecturing students. And he used that same approach when he entered politics and voters did not appreciate being lectured to and they let him know on election day. And so for a time, he thought about leaving politics until he noticed what pastors were doing in churches. And all of a sudden, a few years later, he came back and he started doing a lot of storytelling on the stump. He would modulate his tone. He would pause the dramatic pause. He would use repetition. He would quote the Bible. He would do all of these things that pastors were doing in church. And that is what launched him to the next level. And the reason I mentioned that story is because Obama didn't go and find his talent. He didn't practice for 10,000 hours. He identified what was working in a different field and incorporated it into his own. And that's the power of decoding greatness, of reverse engineering what works in another field and incorporating into your own to create your own unique success story. So I think we're getting the gist of it, but for from somebody who is saying, okay, well, I get it. I may not have a natural inclination or talent, and I may not have time to put in 10,000 hours, but I definitely have time that I could put in reverse engineering something. How do we begin to go about this reverse engineering work? Do we basically say, okay, what field am I in and who, who do I need to take aim at to start observing? Yeah. So I think the first step, and this is something that anyone listening to this can start doing right now, and that is start a collection. And when we think about collections, we think about physical objects, we think about stamps or artwork or books, but that definition is too narrow because collections can apply to knowledge work as well in the form of starting a Google Doc of you know websites that are impressive or marketing materials or emails or well-written memos. And once you have that collection, you can start comparing the objects or the items in your collection against items that didn't make the cut. And it's that process of playing something like, you know, spot the difference that game we played as kids where you would compare two images side by side and look to see what distinguishes one from the other. Here, you're using that same approach to compare the ordinary against the extraordinary, the items not in your collection against those that are in your collection. And in, in doing that consistently, you're automating the learning process over the course of your workday, but also you're giving yourself a place to visit when you need inspiration to create your own original works. And by again, by doing that comparison, you can't help but notice the distinguishing features, the, the ingredients that make successful works unique. And it sounds like this isn't, you know, a one and done kind of a thing. This is something that's essentially a natural progression in your creative arc lifelong. Exactly right. And I can tell you that I know graphic designers who collect logos. I know the copywriters who collect headlines. I'm a writer. I collect words that I consider moving or mo words that, you know, cause me to stand up and take notice. I collect headlines as well, stories, academic journal articles. And then when it's time for me to write a book, I have this library of examples to look at, to be inspired by. And it, it reminds you to, to think big because otherwise, again, it, the, the alternative is staring at a blank page. And if you're someone who's not feeling productive because they're not sure what the first step is to writing a memo or you want to write a compelling 
email, but you're not quite sure how to start, having that library of examples is going to be the first step. And then critically, you know, we talked about spot the difference, but you can also then templatize. Templatize meaning create a template for yourself by working backwards and thinking, okay, if I were to recreate this, what would go in the first paragraph? What would go in the second paragraph? What would go in the third paragraph? And then you've got those templates to look at that saves you time, but also leads you to create better work. Yeah, it makes it more your own so that you're not feeling like you're straddling a line of, okay, how much of their thing can I borrow versus steal versus create my own thing? Because I think that's probably one of the issues people might have is as they are observing slash reverse engineering something somebody has already done or the way they go about doing their thing or their process is that they might fear stealing too much and becoming completely unoriginal or the other side of it going too far into I was inspired by what they did, but then I went way too original and it wasn't received either. What do you say to that spectrum? The spectrum is exactly right. The way you you phrased it, there's actually a study that I talk about in the book that looks at the type of proposals that get approved by agencies like the NIH. And so these are medical experiments that researchers are proposing. And in the study, what they did was they looked at the types of proposals that tended to get funding. And what they found was that the ones that were completely unoriginal, in other words, they felt derivative, they looked like someone else's proposal, something that had already been proven, those tended to be rejected. The ones that were too original and too innovative, those were rejected as well. And so what the researchers describe is an area on the spectrum that they they call optimal newness, which I, in uh, Decoding Greatness, I refer to this as derivative with a twist, which is find a formula that's working and then just make it novel enough so that it becomes your own. So if you're feeling badly because you feel like maybe you're copying too much, I would urge you to, to embrace that instinct. And aim to add some kind of unique innovation that makes the original formula different. And I've been on the receiving end of this. I can tell you that as we talked at the beginning about my Peak Work Performance Summit, shortly thereafter, after I launched that in 2017, there was another summit, also a productivity summit, that looked exactly like mine, like literally same fonts, same colors. And that is an example of something that is not reverse engineering. That's copying. Okay. (laughs) Reverse engineering is a method of learning that allows you to uncover the unique ingredients that make a formula successful so that you can apply it in a new direction. I just want to be clear. Like I'm not trying to give anybody license to copy someone else's work because again, you're not going to be as successful as you otherwise might be. It's a losing strategy. Better for you to understand why it's working so that you can take some of those elements and combine them with other unique elements to create your own remix. What are some examples then of successes that we'd be familiar with and can put a stamp on and say, oh, okay, I get it, where somebody has reverse engineered something and made it original, but also derived inspiration from where they were reverse engineering from? Oh, man, there's so many examples in the book. You know, probably one of my favorites is Malcolm Gladwell. So Gladwell, when he was first starting out, he was influenced by Lee Ross and Paul Nisbet, who was a social psychologist at the University of Michigan. They wrote a book called The Person in the Situation. And what was unique about their book is that they had studies and they had stories and they interweaved them. They didn't do just one or the other. He was inspired by them. He was a science writer. And then he, he got to the New Yorker after spending some time as a someone who was just a reporter writing about science stories where they wrote very short stories. And he had to write longer stories because that was the requirement of the New Yorker. And in the book, I described Gladwell talking about that experience, about how unprepared he felt, how intimidated he was to write a New Yorker style piece where he had to write for 10,000 words and he didn't feel like he could do it. He didn't feel like he could, he had enough firepower to sustain a story. And that is what led him to incorporate studies. And that is what leads to, to us today, where we have that Gladwellian style where almost every nonfiction book uses this approach where they interweave stories and studies. And one of the interesting things where I I think about Gladwell is you'll notice that he doesn't just have stories and studies. He also adds cliffhangers. And I think that comes from his fascination with spy novels. If you ever listen to interviews with him, we'll talk about how he's fascinated with Lee Child and writers of that genre. And I think that is an example of him taking something that was working in the spy genre, adding it to the Lee Ross and uh, Paul Nisbet approach and applying it to create original New Yorker pieces. 
That's so interesting that I hadn't even thought about that or honestly not been aware of that previous to now was the whole idea that Gladwell's Gladwellianness wasn't original to him. In other words, kind of concocted that by, again, inspiring himself from other people doing what he did. And now he he perfected it. He put a spin on it. He became mass adopted because of it. It reminds me in a way of like, say, the Beatles, where, you know, they were at the right place at the right time and wildly influential. But they were inspired by all these smaller, lesser known songs to, to a degree, but then yeah. exploded and then it had massive influence on a much larger scale. So I'll, I'll say two things to that. One is I'll give you one other story, and that is a more recent example, and that is Lin-Manuel Miranda. So it's interesting because we're, we're recording this now that In the Heights is out on Netflix. I think it's that and it's HBO Max. Uh, HBO and, Max, yes. Yeah. So so this is this is a show that is getting rave reviews and it it feels very original unless you saw Hamilton, right? Because then it feels like okay, it's very similar to Hamilton. But what he did here is he's he, in, in the Heights, which was released before Hamilton, is he took the traditional Broadway formula and he added on top of that rap and salsa. So he took a formula that was working and he made it his own by adding his contribution, which was rap and salsa. And he evolved it one step further with his second show, which was Hamilton, which he added a fourth dimension, which was American history. So now you've got rap, salsa and American history layered on top of a Broadway show. And that feels completely original, but really it's not completely original. It's just elements that are working in different domains combined in a new way. The second thing that I would say with regard to Gladwell not being necessarily original is that it's so easy to just assume that unless you're being completely original, you're not being unique. But really the key is to find something that is underutilized and make it your own. And I I just, I, I hope that people don't assume that Gladwell's approach was necessarily better or that the Beatles were necessarily better than some of those other bands. Because I think that what that leads us to assume is that commercial success is the same thing as a better product. And Unfortunately, a lot of things have to happen for commercial success, some of which don't necessarily have to do with a higher level product. And so I just want to warn that commercial success and extraordinary work are not synonymous. Yeah, that is a good point to make. I am glad that you brought that up. I am interested, though, since you've done study into this in terms of, say, a business application for somebody who's listening in and like has lots of ideas. I know that you've basically said that if you work backwards, Starbucks and Chipotle are the exact same strategy. Could you explain that? Unpack that a little bit? Yeah. So first, I will just say that entrepreneurs are exceedingly good at finding patterns that explain why certain businesses are successful. And there's research out of the Harvard Business School that shows that many people assume when you think about entrepreneurs versus like regular managers, many people assume that entrepreneurs maybe are more creative or they're more intelligent, they're more driven. Turns out none of that is true. What really differentiates the uh, high level entrepreneurs from everyone else is that they're really good at pattern recognition. And so an example of a pattern that a smart entrepreneur might notice is that the success of Starbucks and Chipotle can be explained by the same exact underlying principle. Now, at first glance, they seem to have very little in common, right? So Starbucks sells drinks, Chipotle sells food, but both of those companies were built on the same business strategies. And and that business strategy is finding a customer experience that works well somewhere else and then import it into your hometown. So in the case of Starbucks, Howard Schultz visited an Italian coffee bar and he found the experience riveting and he introduced it into Seattle where nothing like that close even existed. Chipotle also has a similar story where Steve Ells saw the successful burrito restaurants of San Francisco and imported them into Denver where Mexican food was a novelty. So that sort of thinking of what is working somewhere else that I can import into my hometown gives you all kinds of formulas for starting a successful business. And the reverse is also true, which is what's working near me that I might be able to sell somewhere else. And it's by thinking in those blueprints that all of these ideas open up to you that you wouldn't have necessarily spotted. And that's the key is looking at thinking in blueprints. And that's an approach that works for entrepreneurs, but it also works for anyone working in a creative field. Well, I think that's one of the things that can be a a, a breakthrough, if you will, we, we, thinking in terms of 
not writer's block, literally, but maybe creator's block or just, oh, I can't come up with any ideas. One, that's where you go back to what you were talking about earlier with the collection or what some people would call a swipe file to say, you know, does something stand out to me or jump out at me as like, ooh, I could do my spin on that or, you know, because you've collected those things. But the other piece being that some of the work's done for you already, you know, in a sense, because – like I said, you're standing on shoulders of giants. So you don't have to do all the creative work yourself. You can start from somewhere that's not the blank canvas. You then need to make significant contribution from your own self. But by getting yourself warmed up or stretched or whatever before the big race, you know, metaphorically, you'll start by not starting cold, you're going to get somewhere quicker and faster and better, much like with that study where they were copying or emulating on the second day and then went back to original stuff the third day. Yeah. And I really want to highlight the difference between copying and producing or reverse engineering and producing. And what that difference is, is that reverse engineering is a learning process. It's an approach and a mindset that empowers you to take exceptional examples and turn them into templates or a roadmap for producing great work. What that isn't is a foolproof approach that is going to lead you to just create original works. Because again, if you're just copying someone else's work, you're not going to be original. What we're talking about here is just having a mindset that unlocks the underlying patterns that make a work successful and using that approach to every aspect of your life so you get smarter about what it is that's standing out for you. So again, it's about a mindset uh, that says, what makes this work? How is this created? What can I learn from this? How can I apply this to my next thing? And that mindset is one that empowers you to learn every step of the way. And, you know, I think a lot of us assume that learning is what happens when we pick up a book or that we take a course. But if you apply this mindset, you can learn all the time just by listening to podcasts or flipping through a magazine or hopping on Netflix, as you mentioned, Eric. That's the way that you learn is by automating this process of continuously asking yourself, how does this work? How was this created? And how can I learn from this? Yeah. You know, my mind goes to what are they doing here and how are they doing it? Whoever, whoever the they is. Yeah. In a sense. So exactly right. Oh, and, and I know you've had personal experience doing this because you did this with basically looking at the most popular TED Talks and looking for patterns. So maybe walk us through what that process looked like in, in real time for you when you did that. Yeah. So, so part of what I do in Decoding Greatness is I show readers how they can unlock hidden patterns in their favorite work. And as an illustration, I walk them through finding patterns inside the most watched TED Talk in the world. And it's a talk delivered by the late Sir Ken Robinson on the topic of how schools stifle creativity. So if you're not familiar with the talk, it's a talk in which he describes how kids are really creative at a young age and then schools just beat the creativity out of it. It's because we're taught to look for the correct answer. And in order to be creative, you can't always just look for the right answer. You just have to be kind of follow your curiosity and suggest all kinds of ideas. And we're rewarded for just finding right answers. And so as a result, we tend to become less creative over time. What you find when you analyze his talk is that many of the features that we assume are related to successful TED Talk are actually missing. And so what I did in reverse engineering it is I quantified all kinds of features. So I look at how long the talk is, what he's doing in each of the paragraphs, what the emotional trajectory he takes you on from paragraph to paragraph. In other words, looking at the transcript, I'm like it's the first, I code every paragraph in, in the transcript. I said, do I feel positive? Do I feel negative? Do I feel neutral? And I show you what the trajectory on. It's kind of like a roller coaster when you do this and find he's all over the place. He's taking you up and down and up and down because he wants you to feel the emotion is key. But the striking thing is when you look at the analysis is that you know how many persuasive facts Robinson dishes out in the entire TED talk, there's a grand total of one fact. Now that to me is remarkable because if I was writing a TED talk from scratch, I would assume I need to pummel you with fact after fact after fact in order to be persuasive. He doesn't do any of that. He's got one fact. What's he doing a lot of? He's doing a lot of storytelling. He's giving you a lot of biographical anecdotes that help you relate to him. He's also telling you a high number of jokes. Over the course of 18 minutes, I think he's got something like 40 jokes. So now I've identified all the distinguishing features by looking at what makes his work distinct from other TED Talks. And now I can turn that into a template. Now, clearly, 
A lot of interesting insights there. And that doesn't necessarily mean that his template is going to work for me because I'm not particularly funny. If you're not a education professor, then then just sharing one fact throughout your entire TED Talk may not work for you. So the key is really to reverse engineer a talk that resonates for your particular style so that you can identify what the formula is and get yourself some ideas on how you might structure your talk. So I'm not suggesting that just because he's had number one talk in the world, his approach is going to be right for everyone. What I am suggesting is that using this approach, you can identify what unique and contributing factors are that make that particular work distinct. Now, I know we talked about, you know, we don't have to have 10,000 hours of practice, but I think people are going to think, well, but if I'm reverse engineering and want to get better at that, don't I need to, quote, practice doing that? And so I wonder what your response to them would be. 100%. So I'm not suggesting that talent or practice don't matter. They absolutely matter. Yes, practicing for 10,000 hours is going to help you improve. Yes, if you're talented, that's going to help you improve. What I don't want people to assume, and I think a lot of people kind of assume this inherently, is that if I don't have a particular talent or I haven't found my talent or I don't have 10 years to practice, that I should just stick with my day job because that's greatness is for someone else. And so what I'm trying to enlighten people about is that there's this other approach that many of the people at the top are using that you can use to improve your performance more quickly. Now, once you understand what the formula is in your particular field, obviously practice is going to help you. And in fact, the second half of decoding greatness is all about skill building. So all of the research around how do we use rapid skill acquisition to improve our performance at whatever task it is that we're interested in getting good at. And one of those elements clearly is practice. And in fact, there's a chapter in the second half of the book on something I call practicing in three dimensions. And what I mean by that is that when most people think of practice, they think about practicing in one dimension. And that dimension is practicing in the present, meaning doing something, you know, playing piano, getting feedback on my performance and utilizing that feedback to get better the next time. But there are two other dimensions of practice that many top performers use, and it's one that anyone can use to improve at whatever task they want. And the first is practicing in the past. And in the research, this is referred to as reflective practice. We've all heard of deliberate practice, which is the Anders Ericsson term for stretching and working on something that you're not particularly good at, getting immediate feedback, and then continuing to rehearse until you get better and better and better. Reflective practice concerns research having to do with looking at your performance in the past and then trying to translate those insights into wisdom, meaning, and just to make this practical, one of the things that anybody can do right now is pick up something called a five-year journal. And these are available on Amazon or any bookstore. How it works is that a five-year journal, you have 365 pages, one day for each day of the year. And on each day, there are five slots. And your job is to take one of those slots and write down what it is you did today or what you learned today. And if you do this for 365 days, in other words, a year, on the 366th day, you'll come back, you'll put in what you did or what you learned that day. And again, it's just three lines, so it's not particularly intimidating. And something magical happens on that page because you get to see what it is you did on that exact day a year before. And so doing this consistently strengthens your memory because you're always being reminded of past events, but it also reminds you of past wins that you may have forgotten about. It reminds you of overblown fears that you assumed were going to ruin your life that ended up not being anything at all. It also forces you to compare your initial expectations against your actual experience. And that's how wisdom comes about. So the five-year journal is a fascinating tool. It's one that I use every night. My wife uses it. All my coaching clients use it. And it's one that you can use to improve your performance. In fact, there's research out of Harvard that if you simply take a few minutes at the end of each day to reflect on what you learned, your performance will lift on average 23%. So that's reflective practice, practicing in the past. Practicing in the future is imagery. So just closing your eyes and visualizing what it is you're about to do in advance. And visualization, I think, is one tool that a lot of people associate with sports. And yes, it can help athletes improve, but it's also something that can help you improve if you're focused on knowledge work. So for example, if your job is to write a memo on Monday morning, simply taking the time on Sunday night to visualize yourself getting into the office, preparing the materials you need, putting your phone in a particular spot, you know, turning off email and thinking about how you might transition from paragraph to paragraph 
paragraph, that leads you to front load decisions. And that process of front loading decisions enables you to get to the office and do a better job and work quicker and be more present because you're not constantly pausing every few seconds to think about what you need to do next. And so imagery is that third dimension of practice that we can all utilize to improve. So again, three dimensions of practicing, practicing in the past, present, and future, reflective practicing for the past, deliberate practice for the present, and then imagery for the future. Love it. Now, I know you also talk about creating a scoreboard. How does that fit into this growth? So there's a chapter in the book on the scoreboard principle. And the scoreboard principle simply states that anything that you measure, you are likely to improve on. There's research showing that if you want to improve your water consumption, track how many ounces of water you consume every day. Want to lower your weight? Keep track of how many calories you intake. If you want to improve your focus at work, keep track of the number of uninterrupted minutes you spend working during the day. And it's by gamifying that we create that loop that gives us that emotional jolt every time we succeed. If our numbers dip, then we feel a little bit of shame and that keeps us motivated. And there's all kinds of evolutionary reasons for why we're obsessed with numbers that I can get into. But the key takeaway here is if you want to build your skill at anything, you want to track the elements that make a particular work successful so that you can give yourself a score and give yourself that immediate feedback that tells you whether or not you're succeeding and keeps you both motivated and on track on a successful execution. Gotcha. Okay. So it's kind of a, it's almost like a compass. It's, it's okay. I've got my bearings for where I am right now and where I've been. Exactly right. And if you, if all you do is just take the time to identify what are the elements that make for a successful day for me, give yourself four metrics that you can measure at the end of the workday to see how successful you were on that particular workday. Maybe it's, I don't know, maybe it's how many clients you connected with. Maybe it's how many pages you wrote or how many words you wrote, whatever it is that you're working on, there are going to be elements that identify a successful day for you. I can tell you that you know, I've, I've been alive on earth for 44 years. And for me, there are three components of a successful day. One is I learned something new. Two is I got to be creative. And three is I exercised. It's a pretty simple list. And if I stay true to those three things every day, I'm going to be a pretty happy person. How many of those days do I actually follow through on those things? I don't know. Uh, not as much as I like, but just having that direction gives me that compass, as you pointed out, that tells me whether or not I'm on the right track and gives me that immediate feedback that also helps me self-correct because now I'm more mindful about the elements that actually contribute to a happy day. Interesting. Yeah. There's so much more even in the book that we could unpack. And there's so much here that we could even dive deeper into. But I think the best thing is to just direct people to where they can get the book and start doing some of the homework, whether they think they're creative or not. That's not even an issue here, because this isn't just about being creative. This is about basically doing great work and and unlocking some of the you know, I, I talked earlier about superpowers. You know, I'm, tr I'm still trying to think about, you know, who's that third superhero that's like, well, I guess we, we named Sherlock Holmes, but I'm kind of like, you know, he did analyze everything and kind of break it down. That was almost just the correlation between him and Batman. I guess Batman's just Sherlock Holmes with like Kung Fu style. You know what's interesting, Eric? I'll, 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 just because we're on this this tangent, uh, I'll tell you what's interesting is that I was reading about deconstructing novels over the weekend. And one of the things they pointed out is that in many superhero movies, the superhero is someone who's got that talent and inborn strength. But in a remarkable number of instances, the villain is man-made, is self-made. That's really interesting if you think about it. Like Lex Luthor, he's self-made. If you think about all the, the Spider-Man villains. A lot of times it's like that professor who like injected him with some himself with something in order to be able to fight that man. It's just an interesting insight that again, when you apply this reverse engineering approach, you uncover insights like that, that sometimes that formula of writing that superhero film requires a man-made villain. Interesting. Yeah. Oh gosh. I, yeah. We, we're going to have to stop talking about this now or I'm going to go <laughs> over about this forever, but I would love to point people to where they can grab the book. I know that they're, you know, they can get it wherever books are sold, but is there a special place where they can learn more about it and maybe find out more, jump in, discover more about it on your site? There is, and it is decodinggreatnessbook.com. And the reason I want to point you to that website is because it allows you to buy the book wherever you like and submit your receipt. And when you do that, you get a free course on reverse engineering and how you can apply it to your field. It's completely free. You just have to send in your receipt for the book. You could buy it in any format. And if you're interested in learning more about my work, I would encourage you to visit ronfriedmanphd.com where you'll find all kinds of articles and giveaways and things of that nature. 
Very cool. Ron, thank you so much for visiting us and talking about this. This is a great topic to talk about right now as we're kind of trying to figure out, you know, what's next in a lot of different ways. So really glad to talk to you. Thanks for being here. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Eric. Well, that's another podcast crossed off your listening to-do list. I hope that you enjoyed this conversation with Ron Friedman, and I hope that you've got an inkling of where you can start to go with reverse engineering in your life. I've already been thinking of ways to improve this show, as well as branch out with some other projects I've been thinking about doing in the near future, thanks to reverse engineering. I'm sure that you know somebody who needs to hear this conversation. Would you do me the favor of sharing this episode with them? Just hit the share button in that podcast player app of choice that you're using, or hit the share button over at the show notes for this episode at beyondthetodolist.com. If you would do me that favor, that would be so awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you for listening, and I will see you next episode.